So, so a belief is mainly what I'm going to be talking about, and specifically about how our beliefs and our biology are, are intertwined. And um, first, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about speaking in tongues um, and what this tells us about this interaction between biology and belief. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of what we know about how this interaction works. And uh, finally, I'm going to talk about the, the cultural syndromes, which are mental illnesses or conditions that occur in some cultures, but not, not other cultures, and um, how the beliefs that inform those syndromes make up the culture around us. So um, first, I wanted to talk about uh, an experience I had with my, my brother, my younger brother. Um, I grew up in a town uh, in Minnesota on the Mississippi River. It's kind of a small town. And uh, our family were Methodists. You know, it's a little boring. My younger brother, uh, when he was about 14 or 15, uh, started going to uh, this charismatic evangelical church. Um, you know, and, and looking back, it was, it was a good thing for him. Um, but for the rest of the family, uh, it was kind of annoying because he was constantly trying to convert us and, and, and failing. Um, I was in college at the time, and I wasn't really interested in anybody telling me what to believe, least of all my, my little brother. And, um, but, you know, I tried to keep an open mind about stuff. And so when he asked me to come to his church, I, I said I would. So we went to, to his church, which was this church here, actually, this old kind of Romanesque church, which at one point was Catholic, I think, before it got sold off. And, um, and uh, you know, there's a synthesizer playing, kind of three chords. There was a pastor who went into a sermon about you know, God's hand and everything, God's mysterious plan. It was like a, a really long sermon. I don't know if you guys have been to these services, but they're super long. And, um, but at some point, like a, a tension started to kind of creep into his voice, and this, 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 it started to build in this urgency that, that reminded me sort of partly of a revival and partly of an infomercial. <laughs> and um, he was talking about speaking in tongues and how, you know, kind of the history of it, what it is, and you know, pretty soon I could tell what was going to happen. It was, it was, um, you could feel it. He sort of built up to it, and uh, and sure enough, at some point, people stood up and raised their hands and you know, sort of rock back and forth slightly, and, um, and the spirit kind of descended onto them, and they were sort of rambling in this, in this sort of rhythmic babble. And, uh, you know, I looked at my brother, and he was doing the same thing. And, um, you know, nothing happened to me. But, um, but I, was, I was struck kind of at that point about how, you know, we could, he and I grew up in the same country, in the same town, in the same house even. But we were living in these completely different worlds, you know, one where this thing was possible and one where it, it wasn't. And, um, you know, but I was, I was sort of converted in one way that day. Because before that, I really thought that uh, speaking in tongues was just sort of showmanship or, or fakery. And, um, and after that, I knew that I was wrong and I knew that this was a real thing. And by real, I don't mean that necessarily that it was God's language being spoken. That's a separate question. Um, but what I mean is that what people were, were experiencing was, was real and not fake in any way. And, um, you know, to my brother, this, this realness was a clear indication of, of God's power. Uh, but to me, it was, it was more of an indication of our own and of the power that our beliefs can, can have over us. Um, so a few years later, I went to uh, Tanzania in East Africa, where I taught English for a year. And, um, and at one point, we, start, we started to see these signs posted around the town for this guy, uh, a German evangelist named Reinhard Bonnke, who was coming to town for a big, huge revival, which he, he calls crusades, which is kind of a bad choice of words. But, um, but, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know who he was, but I later found out that he specializes in these crusades in Africa, which this is actually a picture from that um, event, and uh, and he claims to be able to heal, you know, polio, cancer, blindness, deafness, tuberculosis. Uh, he even once performed supernatural reconstructive surgery, and 
He also claimed to have resurrected a, a dead man in Nigeria once, which was a slight improvement on the dead baby that he resurrected in the mother's womb the previous year. So, so it sounded like it was going to be a good show. Um, <laughs> You know, so I went, everybody I know went. It was this huge thing. There were like tens of thousands of people in this big field next to a granary downtown. And uh, you know, he also had his, his sort of long sermon. And when that was over, he started also telling us about this time back in Jerusalem uh, when a group of true believers, you know, were suddenly so taken with the Holy Spirit that uh, they started speaking in this language that they didn't understand and the devil didn't understand and, and God, only God understood it. And, uh, and he went into this long explanation, you know, that when, how when he gave us a clue, we too would speak in this language. And, uh, and he would say, but not yet. And then he would circle around to another point until, and he kept doing that and it would keep building until we would receive this, this blessing. And uh, to show how we were supposed to receive it, he took this uh, 10,000 shilling note and he called this young boy up on stage and like held it out for him. And, and the boy came up and grabbed it and ran away. And he said, that's how easy it is. Um, you know, which was 10,000 shillings was about $20. So that was a lot of money. So that got people's attention. Um, and, and when he said this, he kind of gave us a cue. And everybody in the audience raised their hands. And, uh, you know, and I also raised my hands and closed my eyes. And nothing happened. But all around me, you know, thousands of people speaking in tongues. Um, you know, it was, it was amazing. And, um, you know, it's, and it's kind of easy sometimes to make fun of these things, and, and there's some good material there, to be honest. But, um, but there's also something really important going on. Um, because in the past, uh, speaking in tongues, you know, which is also known as glossolalia, was thought by kind of Western medical types to be the product of sort of uh, weak, primitive, uh, ignorant minds. And uh, in the mid 20th century, there was some talk about whether it should be considered a mental illness or pathology. Um, but in, uh, in 1972, a woman named Felicitas Goodman uh, published this book, Speaking in Tongues, a Cross-Cultural Study of Glossolalia, which was published by University of Chicago Press, by the way. Um, and she concluded that it wasn't abnormal. Rather, it was, a, it was a disassociative state, like a religious trance state across the world, like, like those in Hungarian shamans and Tibetan uh, oracles and, and American Indian medicine men. And, um, and she also found that it was, it was a learned behavior. Um, what looked like a spontaneous thing was not really that. It was, it was um, it, 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 a powerful conditioning factor, she said, was, was cultural expectation. And that, that expectation was transmitted to people by demonstration or word of mouth. You know, so somehow they were kind of explained how they would, what this behavior looked like, how it happens, and what it, what it appears like to onlookers. So in other words, it's a, it's a kind of script that's learned, uh, regardless of what sort of neurological or spiritual doorways it opens. Um, and setting the spiritual doorways aside, we, we do have a little bit of, of knowledge about what kind of neurological doors our glossolalia opens. You know, neuroimaging has shown that it's associated with specific neural patterns, neural correlates. And, um, you know, it, that it also that it's a learned state. It can be induced almost uh, sometimes on cue. Um, and it seems to have a variety of health benefits, reducing stress, and no negative effects that anybody can, can come up with. So, and in one patient, um, glossolalia produced a spike in her right temporal lobe that made her left arm twitch whenever she spoke in tongues, but at no other time. And, uh, and it was a, like a reminder that, as one, as one writer uh, observed, that you know, brain activity can be caused by behavior as well as causing it. So uh, just as, you know, as an aside, the fact that there are neurological patterns associated with glossolalia says nothing about the, the religious experience that people are having. You know, it, it doesn't mean that the brain is causing this experience. Uh, I just want to be clear about that. And uh, <coughs> any more than the neural correlates of somebody eating an apple means that they're not really eating an apple. 
So the point, but the point here is that you know you have this this neurological state that people can learn that's difficult, if not impossible, to attain without a certain set of beliefs, and that those beliefs um, can essentially alter your brain to put you in this in this disassociative state. So, you know, in our culture, that's not really uh, how we understand things. Um, ours is a very um, mechanistic view of of how the brain and the body works, and you can see this in our in our metaphors we use when we talk about the body. We talk about it in terms of like a car, and then the doctor's kind of this mechanic who fixes stuff, fixes the parts. We talk about the brain. We talk about it as a computer, um, and we have this sort of sense that that um, everything biological is kind of real and, and primary, and the mental stuff is secondary, and it's caused by the biological stuff. That's sort of our, our cultural bias. Um, and it's, it's what's known as a bottom-up uh, view of, of this kind of causation. But what this, this understanding of, of glossolalia suggests is that there's a, also a top-down model where our beliefs, our ideas, our expectations can act downward on the body and on, our, on the biological processes. So, you know, we all sort of know this, um, and it's not that controversial, and neither of these is really the whole picture, but um, for a long time, people have tried to come up with other models that can sort of, sort of accommodate for these things. In uh, 1977, uh, a psychiatrist named George Engel came up with the, what he called the biopsychosocial model, uh, which is, a way of trying to trying to incorporate these things. It gets a little messy with when you throw like society in there because it's hard to measure society kind of. Um, in in 1999, another uh, philosopher named Ian Hacking came up with this idea called the bio loop, in which our physiology and our beliefs and ideas kind of each are influencing each other. And um, you know, one place where you can see this sort of process really clearly is in uh, the research around uh, the placebo effect, which some of you, have, I'm sure, have read about. There's been a lot of interesting stuff out there. And, but I just want to clarify that when, I'm talk when I say the placebo effect, I'm not talking about an imaginary phenomenon. I'm talking about a, like a real uh, psychobiological phenomenon that some people call some people call it the care effect. Some people call it the meaning response. Some people call it the expectancy effect. Uh, and I'll just give an example of, of how it actually works. Um, one of the first studies that changed kind of how people think about the placebo effect was in 1978 at the University of California. They took patients who had impacted wisdom teeth and divided them into two groups. Um, each group got a placebo painkiller. Um, both groups had uh, pain relief from the placebo painkiller. And then in one of the groups, they, they gave, uh, without their knowing, they gave them naloxone, which uh, deactivates the opiates in your system. We all know that now. Um, and so in that group where they were getting, given a hidden administration of, of naloxone, their pain started to increase. So it showed that um, that you know, there was something more than just perception going on here. You know, the, the belief that people were getting a painkiller actually caused their bodies to produce a painkiller, which was then deactivated by the naloxone. And um, the Fabrizio Benedetti, the guy who wrote this book on the left, uh, has done a lot of really interesting research on this. And, uh, and he's found that, you know, it takes much higher doses of hidden painkillers to get the same relief as those given in full view. Um, he found that the, the anxiety drug diazepam worked much better when it was given with the full knowledge of the patient than when it was given secretly. Uh, he found that Parkinson's patients needed nearly twice the voltage of deep brain stimulus uh, when their treatment was hidden than when they knew it was being turned on. You know, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of studies along these lines. But you know, so what that means is that you might think that your pain relief comes from the Tylenol you take, and, and some of it does. But some of it also comes from your belief in the ibuprofen. 
Some of it comes from the name brand, that also matters. Some of it comes from the act of taking it or knowing that you took it. And uh, you know, the anthropologist uh, Dan Mormon, who wrote this other book, which is excellent as well, um, likes to say that there's more to biology than biology. And uh, to, for him, uh, meaning is kind of the operative thing. And, and I basically agree with that. Uh, I would phrase it a little bit differently, even though I think we're talking about the same thing. I would say that belief is really what is going on here. And uh, you know, your belief in the doctor, belief in biochemistry, your belief in the, the power of the pill that you're taking, your belief that one thing will cause another to happen, and uh, you know, your belief that a certain medicine or operation will have a certain effect. And Benedetti writes that um, to, there's increasing evidence that beliefs and expectations can play a salient role in human health and that placebos can mimic enhance, mask, or prevent the beneficial responses to pharmacological agents. So, so you know, our beliefs are, are powerful. In, in a sense, our beliefs are, are biological. You know, but where exactly does their, their power come from? And where do we get those beliefs? You know, those are, those are kind of big questions. And those are the questions I'm fascinated with. And uh, those are the questions that led me into researching the the cultural syndromes or culture-bound syndromes, which are, are the mental illnesses that only that occur in some places and not others. And, um, and the first one of these that I, that I heard about was, um, it's called Coro or genital retraction syndrome. And um, you know, I was 2001 when I saw these actually stories on the BBC website in Benin in Nigeria. And um, where, you know, somebody, there would be these kind of panics where people would, some people would uh, be accused of stealing penises through magical means, and then those people would be lynched by a crowd, and it would cause all kinds of chaos and stuff. And, uh, and I just thought this was fascinating, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And what, what I kept thinking about was not really whether penises were being stolen or not, because that's not, didn't seem that interesting. But, um, <laughs> But what it would feel like to live in a world like that, you know, where that was possible, you know, where there are these dangerous forces that could literally like whisk your genitals away at any point in time. And so, um, and I was really struck by the fact that the crowds uh, would, would lynch the, the accused thief like right away, which suggested to me that, that this belief is super strong and very few people would doubt that, it, that it's possible, even if they don't think it's this, maybe not true, but. Um, but I, I, so I, and I know how powerful the beliefs of people around us can be. So I, I went to Nigeria and, um, you know, with the help of some Nigerian writer friends, I did manage to track down a couple of victims of penis theft and I got their stories and they were terrifying as you can imagine. Um, but after I got home, I started, I continued kind of researching and reading about other cultural syndromes around the world who were equally fascinating. Um, you know, in, uh, in Malaysia, for example, they have uh, something called lata, which is a, a fright response, where if you startle someone who's lata, they have to kind of imitate you and uh, mimic your movements and your words and stuff, and they'll blurt out profanities and all kinds of other stuff that's really complicated and hard to understand. Um, in Korea, they have hua byung, which I'm not going to pronounce these right, but it's like an anger sickness where people feel like kind of your anger can become this solid mass in your, in your stomach. And, um, you know, you get, you get uh, pain in your abdomen, fear of death, tiredness uh, resulting from this. In China, sometimes people have uh, what's called frigophobia or fear of, of cold, which is in Chinese cosmology, you're supposed to balance everything between hot and cold, and if you lose too much of the hot, it can make you vulnerable to things. So some pe these people will wear like winter clothes when it's 90 degrees, so they can keep their their heat in. Uh, in uh, one uh, in part in the part of India, there's just something called lizard syndrome, where people feel like there's a, a lizard that gets under your skin and your back and is crawling up your back, and if it reaches your neck, you'll die of asphyxiation. And so they'll come into the hospital with these crushed marks on their back from trying to kill the lizard. Um, in Japan, there's a, 
there's a condition called, you may have heard of, called, called hikikomori, which is a kind of severe social withdrawal. Usually young people have it, uh, and uh, where they'll, they'll refuse to leave their room or their house for at least six months, sometimes years and years, and get necrosis on their legs from sitting so long. And I think the last number I heard of cases was like half a million or something. Um, in, uh, in Cambodia, sometimes people have kyal attacks or wind attacks, uh, which there's kyal is a wind-like substance that flows in your, uh, alongside your blood, and if it gets, if it gets blocked, um, you know, your, you get, your limbs get cold and they can die, and you get tinnitus and blurry vision and dizziness and, and blindness and death even. Um, in Germany, uh, they have uh, what's called Horsturz, um, and that's a sudden loss of hearing from, from stress. And, uh, you know, the first person I mentioned this to was one of my in-laws who's from Germany, and she said, oh, yeah, my dad has that. You know, it's like, it's super common. Uh, in, in India, in another part of India, there's a syndrome called puppy pregnancy syndrome, which, um, where people believe that if you get bit by a dog that's sexually aroused, you can become pregnant with that dog's puppies. And, you know, you get abdominal pain, discomfort, fatigue, nausea, uh, flatulence, heartburn, acid reflux. You know, it's like pregnancy, I guess. And um, except that if you're a male, you, the belief is that you will birth these puppies out of your penis and then die, which sounds unpleasant. They're so cute. <laughs> so a lot of these conditions occur in just one particular place, but others occur kind of across the world in different forms. And um, I wanted to see what the genital retraction syndrome looked like you know, in other parts of the world as well. So, so I went to... Um, to China, where in to Hainan Island, which is this island in the far south of China, and um, that's where in 1984 and 85 on, on Hainan Island there was this huge epidemic of of genital retraction that that affected as many as 5,000 people. And um, but but here it wasn't um, it wasn't magic that that caused the the panic and that retraction. It was a uh, it was a ghost or a fox spirit that would come around and, and attack people in the night. And, um, you know, it would, the attack would come and hit a village and last for f three or four days. And then as soon as they heard about it happening in another village, it would kind of subside. And it slowly sort of made its way around the island for like a year. Um, so I went there and tried to, tried to find people who, who it happened to. And um, I'll read you uh, one story that was recorded by a cultural psychiatrist named Wolfgang Jilek, who's, who's still around, he's retired. And um, you know, I love this story because it, it shows you just how terrifying this experience can be and how, how total it can be, not just for the victim, but for everybody involved. And um, so Jilek talked to this young man who lived in uh, Zhangjiang town, which is actually a little north of Hainan. Um, this guy was 28 years old. Uh, he worked as an accountant. He had nine years of formal schooling, and uh, his attack happened after he got into bed and he couldn't fall asleep. And this is kind of his account of, he said it was, it was 20 minutes past 10 p.m. I saw the window was open. I heard something jumping into my bedroom. I turned on my torch and I looked over but could not see anything. So I went to bed again and I felt something in front of me. I stretched out my hand to grab the thing, but there was nothing there. So I went out to look, but I couldn't see anything. I felt cold, and I went back to bed, but I couldn't sleep. I was shivering. Suddenly, I felt my genitals shrink into my abdomen. I tried to hold my penis, but could not feel it anymore, only very tiny. I ran out, calling the neighbors for help. A neighbor immediately set off firecrackers and rang the bell and beat the drum. Another neighbor got a fishnet and threw it over me and covered me with a fishnet. They took two chopsticks and squeezed the middle finger of my left hand. If one squeezes the left middle finger, according to what people said, the evil spirit will get out there. They squeezed my middle finger for an hour. 
Other neighbors held onto my penis with their hands. They took turns holding it tight. All the while, they'd also beat the drum. They hit the floor with a vegetable chopper and yelled, get out, you evil spirits. They also beat me under the fishnet with sandals and slippers. Actually, they beat the evil spirit, yelling, evil spirit, get out. If you stay in him, we will kill you. I did not feel any pain. I was too afraid. I thought I would die. After one hour, I felt better. There was a little bleeding on my penis from the pulling. I fell asleep, was so tired. The next morning, there was some bleeding. I went to the hospital outpatient clinic, and I never had any attack again, but still cannot sleep well. I'm still afraid at night that I might get an, get an attack again. So, so, he, so he's got some pretty good neighbors. <laughs> Yeah, I, have, I have like my neighbors too, but I think his are better. <laughs> but this, this gives you a sense of, of how everyone is on the same page with this. Um, you know, and afterwards, researchers came down from, from Guangzhou, and uh, they interviewed people and found that 100% uh, of the victims had prior knowledge of this condition. Um, because you know this had happened before on Hainan Island, and everybody knew the stories. They knew the older residents remembered the epidemics of 1948, 1955, 1966, 1974 that affected hundreds of people as well. You know, and in the end, the scientists concluded that Koro was a, a, a culture-related psychiatric disorder because the traditional beliefs made it possible, and then familiar, and then real, and. You know, that's how stories work. Um, when you first hear one, it makes something possible. When you hear it again, it makes it familiar. And if you hear it enough times from enough people, it makes it real. And because when everyone around us is telling a certain kind of story, it becomes very hard to resist it, especially the people close to us. And when we, and when we tell a story, um, usually what we're really telling is some, it, telling about some underlying cause of the story's events, what the writer Tim O'Brien called something sliding beneath the story's surface. You and I probably can't imagine running out into the yard and holding onto your neighbor's genitals, probably. <laughs> Maybe you can. Um, but that's just because uh, you and I don't believe, don't, don't know those stories, and we don't believe in the things that are sliding under their surfaces. You know, but we're not immune from this either. You know, we, we have our own stories um, and our own syndromes that, that grow out of them. Um, you know, in the past, we've had things like recovered memory syndrome or multiple personality disorder or Gulf War syndrome. Uh, today, we have something called Truman syndrome, where people believe they're on a reality TV show, even though they're not. Uh, we have things like anorexia and bulimia, which don't really occur or occur much less in other cultures. More recently, we have something called orthorexia nervosa, which is an obsession with uh, clean or pure food, which is becoming more common. Uh, we have wind turbine syndrome, where people are made sick by the, the sound of wind turbines near their, near their homes. Um, we have epidemics of psychogenic Parkinsonism where, I don't know if you remember those girls in New York who were all twitching uncontrollably in a school, uh, and they thought it was some sort of pollution or something, but it was a, it was a, a psychogenic illness that spread through the school. Um, and those things are becoming more common as well. Um, we have something, sometimes people include chronic fatigue syndrome in this category, which is controversial, but um, doesn't seem to occur in other cultures. We have, you guys have probably read about these sonic attacks at the Cuban embassy. Um, there's a lot of indicators. It has all, these have all, has all the hallmarks of, of one of these uh, conditions as well that's, that's driven by the fear of the condition. And the symptoms are, are real, but they're, they're not caused by a, a secret sonic weapon. It, it, uh, Robert Bartholomew, who writes a lot about these things, uh, argues that this is a, a kind of mass hysteria. And that's like a common term. It's got a lot of historical weight. I would rather personally speak about these things in terms of a kind of narrative epidemiology because we all have our own stories and our own beliefs. And you know, as we've seen in a 
Nigerian town and a Chinese village and, uh, he, you know, uh, and an American church, these stories have consequences and they can, they can literally become part of us in a way. And I would go even further and suggest that many of the illnesses that we believe are purely mechanical, purely biological, also have a, a significant cultural component. Things like ADHD, depression, anxiety, uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, uh, even schizophrenia. You know, there was a big, this big article just came out about that, about how culture influences schizophrenia. And, um, you know, rates of these things vary widely across the world as do their symptoms and their courses and stuff, you know, not, none of which is to suggest that they're not real, only that, uh, or that there's not biology involved in these things. It's just to, and this doesn't make them any easier to treat necessarily. It's just to say that there's been this piece missing from our quest to understand them and to understand sort of what culture is and how it works. And, um, you know, I like to propose kind of a new working definition. And what I'd like to suggest is that uh, culture is the ecosystem of stories that we feel part of and that we share with another group of people. And I mean, by that I mean stories about the past, stories about the present, stories about the future, um, stories about heroes and villains and ordinary people, stories about the physical world and the spiritual world. and. Um, you know, because stories about love and loss and hope and luck and all these things, because in each story there's some, there's some causal force underneath them that feels, makes things feel at first possible and then familiar and then real. And that causal understanding or that belief uh, is, I think, the missing piece of this bio loop. And, you know, I don't, I don't, there's a danger in overstating the power of this piece as well, you know. Uh, obviously, things like supernatural reconstructive surgery and resurrection are ridiculous for Reinhard Bonnke or anyone else. But, um, but for too long, I do think we've ignored the power of our own beliefs and even the reality of them. You know, and instead, we've been looking at sort of the car without the driver and the hardware without the software. You know, because everyone across the world has some kind of ghost jumping into their room and into their machines. And I believe that we would be better off if we could just turn the lights on and try to see these things a little more clearly. Thank you.